try to keep track of people who want to ask questions, and you can direct it to, uh, like I said before, we're not going to have time for all the candidates to answer one question, but um, I don't know, we'll just have to see how this goes. I don't have a specific plan for it. <laughs> um, I will ask you, um, I know this is the valley, I, love, I know people love to stand up and talk, 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 but this is for a question. Okay, so this isn't for a long comment, this is please to ask a question. And, um, and also candidates to try to keep it short so everybody has enough time, you know, to sort of get equal, equal time here. <laughs> uh, I have a question for Natalie. You mentioned, uh, you mentioned clean energy and climate change. Did you? Yes. Okay. So I'm just wondering, where do you think biomass, thermal energy, biomass, electricity production, how, how do you feel about those things as clean energy and climate change, as climate change issues? So uh, climate change is, is real. Uh, <laughs> when I was working for Congress in the there were people in Congress who questioned that. And that's not okay. Climate change is absolutely real. It is absolutely impacting us. And uh, when I was working for Congress and Governor, one of the things that we uh, were dealing with at the time was the, uh, any, the pipeline coming through our region. And one of the things that I was tasked with in that office was that project and working with FERC and drafting letters uh, based on the concerns that we were hearing from our communities. And yeah. But, but what I want to know is how you feel like biomass. Yeah. Is. So what I was going to say is I think that, you know, that we have a lot of issues here with climate change and we need to be diversifying our energy portfolio, generally speaking. I think there's a lot of concerns in our communities about siting of biomass. I think I, you know, I was in Asheville at a um, special town meeting talking about bylaws for building large infrastructure, biomass, pipelines, all of those things. And, uh, and for me, I think we need to be looking at diversifying our energy portfolio. Uh, so you support biomass? Well, as part of, the, as part as of, part of the larger, yes, absolutely. We need to be looking at every option available to us right now, including renewable energy technology uh, and energy efficiency in our homes. Okay. Anybody else want to respond to that? Oh, I'll just jump in and say, I think Greenfield illustrated where my distinction is that Greenfield voted down big biomass of you know large incinerator like plants that are going to um, really not be in line with the um, the capacity of our region and pumping out a lot of pollutants as well but small biomass of the kind that powers Cooley Dickinson Hospital or some of the local schools in Vermont Vermont has, has used um, wood chips to power most of their small schools, um, that can be appropriately scaled. And I think uh, one of the things that we need to do is have working farms and working forests. Those are the, both the, the ways that you preserve open land and forested land is not just by, we have a very small amount of old growth forest in this region. Uh, most of our forest is working forest and we need to keep it healthy and sustainable. So I think small, perfectly scaled biomass can be part of the mix. I just will make a point that when I was in Greenfield, I actually stood out not for biomass. I was, um, I believe in different systems of renewable energy, and I, by speaking with my neighbors, I know this was going to be a larger issue that um, have even um, wider impacts into the community too. So I would like, um, I'm open to the conversation, of course, but I, I would like to see different ways of renewable energy, like no more parking lots, instead more solar <laughs> parking lots. That's what I would like to see. Great. The other thing to think about, and, and biomass is, would, would, in my eyes, be pretty far down the line in terms of renewable energy choices. There are only so many investment dollars that are available for renewable energy. There needs to be more, but it is a finite pie for renewable energy investment. And I think we need to be making our investments in even cleaner forms of renewable energy, such as wind or solar, or probably technologies that none of us have heard of before. Is it part of the diversified energy portfolio? It absolutely is. It should not include waste products, construction waste, etc. But on a small scale, it is part of that diversification. But again, if we're thinking about prioritizing 
clean, one clean energy versus another, it, it's, it's not the most efficient energy source. It is not as big a job as producer. And it doesn't have as clean a track record as other options. So is it part of it? Yes. Is it way down on that, on that priority list? Absolutely it is, for all the re reasons I've listed. Okay. Nathaniel? I, I don't know, maybe, if, I don't know if people need the microphone, if you can speak louder, I don't know. <laughs> Which is, what's oh, what works. Uh, there are enough, there's enough space on the roofs in Massachusetts to power the whole state. I don't think we need to be pushing towards large scale anything when we can decentralize the whole energy network. Uh, we can invest in more uh, programs that provide uh, rebates, that provide um, incentives for individual homeowners to put solar panels on their own homes, uh, as well as um, invest in community projects uh, like the one that we have here in Sutherland our elementary school. Um, and beyond that, I'd like to see uh, a, a, a series of projects set up that allow individual communities, not towns, but smaller communities, uh, to pool resources to be able to do solar in a way that makes more sense for everybody. Uh, I live in one of the little developments uh, over here in town, a little cul-de-sac over here, um, and there's not enough room individually for us to be able to put up any kind of real system, but if we have some common land, we can be able to put up a, a, an array. Um, but I think more than anything else, the, the, the problem we have is that if 20 years ago, the country had thrown ourselves into solar, into wind, into Fusion, doesn't matter what, if we throw ourselves into anything the way we throw ourselves into the pharmaceutical industry, the way we throw ourselves into war, we would not be talking about this today. Um, and of course that doesn't help us today. Woohoo, we go back in time. But, but today we don't need to be talking about moving to intermediary technologies, technologies that are still putting carbon into the atmosphere, uh, technologies that are not 100% renewable, 100% clean. Um, there is always pollution involved with biomass, and so I am against biomass personally. Um, that being said... That's two minutes. <laughs> so I'm, I'm going to limit this to two minutes so that we don't, you know, kind of get stuck on one person or even one topic. Uh, any last comments on biomass or climate change or whatever? Okay, Lauren, you had a question. I don't, I'm not sure who would like to answer it, hopefully uh, two or three of you at least. What would you propose to do to reform and democratize the rules of the Massachusetts House so that a progressive agenda can get through? Why is it in this most democratic state we have to rely over and over again to citizens' referenda to get progressive legislation through? What would you do to get a hearing for your progressive legislation by changing the rules of the House? Yeah, I think this is a really good question. Thank you, Lauren. I think about it a lot as an attorney because Massachusetts has the oldest constitution in our country, and what's baked into that is a seniority system in the state house. And so there is there's a, a huge ramp to, to make progressive change, to make any change at all. And when you're first elected into office, uh, you're very much a, a junior legislator. And it takes a while to build up, and that's one reason why uh, it kind of promotes holding office for a very long time. So things that we could think about to address this are things like term limits in Massachusetts. That would, that would keep things moving a lot more. Um, we can also think about issues about getting money out of politics. You know, I opened the Boston Globe this morning and I saw this beautiful picture of, of uh, Senator Warren, but the headline was about how much money she raised. And wouldn't it be nice if someday headlines about politicians and money were a thing of the past and we could read about the issues that are affecting all of us and not just about millions of dollars. So we really have to look at some basics and, and I think that's money and I think uh, term limits would be a good place to start. Thank you, yeah, I think this is a really important question and, and it brings on some, some more thoughts as well um, in terms of just reforming our democracy here in the Commonwealth. So right now it's pretty obvious that the Speaker of the House has a tremendous amount of power as to what legislation actually gets voted on. And I think that absolutely we need to look at what rules we can specifically reform uh, to sort of decentralize that power, right? Other things that I support in terms of democratic reforms is we should be having same-day voter registration. And I come at this with the perspective of, of being a student at UMass. There are a number of students who would like to vote who have just moved uh, to campus, but because of the rules we have here in the Commonwealth, they're not able to do that, right? Um, 
Christine had mentioned getting money out of politics. This is actually one particular area that really uh, I've been passionate about my whole life. Uh, I was able to pass a resolution in Worthington actually before I was even able to vote. So I actually had to go to the select board and say, hey, can you put this on the, on the, um, the agenda? Um, but it was endorsing a constitutional amendment um, that would uh, take back sort of what we saw with Citizens United. Um, and you know, one of the struggles you have running for office is you're expected to raise a lot of money. Uh, you know, and I'm a candidate who I don't want to accept uh, big uh, super PAC donations or, or corporate uh, money from the fossil fuel industry and having to, to fundraise to, to pay for yard signs and literature, it's really opened my eyes to the fact that, you know what, this is really prohibiting a lot of good people from running for office. It's just not acceptable that you have to raise $50,000, uh, $100,000 to win a state house seat or a state senate seat. So there are a lot of democratic reforms we need to make. And yes, absolutely, I agree with you. We need to decentralize some of the power that the speaker has and leadership has. Go ahead. So um, I am a super progressive uh, candidate by values. And however, I feel that I'm a good listener because progress doesn't happen if we don't move forward together. We need to move without alienating people. So. You know, we all care about the 15, 15 minimum wage. I, you know, within the past three years, I have been a delegate to the convention um, in Massachusetts. Last year, I actually was um, part of the ORMA delegates because I want to see change in the progressive agenda for Democrats. Um, you know, I want to see like um, opportunities for um, better taxation for those who <laughs> make more money, right? For um, higher the rich um, corporations and the people. Our, you know, our. A state have a lot of lobbyists that know how to get the money. Our health insurance is a predatory system. Our housing is a predatory has a predatory mortgage lending system. The banks. So I, you know, these are, these are the spaces. But we need to be able to to keep this um, knowledge bringing forward in the state house to ensure that people understand the consequences. Because again, our um, our <laughs> poor people are suffering the most if we don't move forward with the progressive agenda. Um, and hopefully um, we do a good job doing this together. Lauren, I'd like to give you a, 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 a direct example of, of what we could do. Uh, Massachusetts State House, in, in, the, in, the, in, the House, in the House of Representatives, if you want to file a bill, that bill has to be filed in the first two weeks of the session. To me, that's going to that's gonna stagnate any real progressive change legislatively, because one of us up here is going to be new in January. There are going to be other new members of the legislature that are that, in January. We have two weeks to figure out what the best course is in terms of filing a bill. That's stamping down progressive policy agendas like nothing I can imagine. Now, other people might say, you're crazy. It's never, you're never going to affect that change. But that is one direct example that you could take. To, um, to, to allow for more progressive policy in, in the state house. Maybe it's six months, I don't know what that duration is, but two weeks is unconscionable. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna stop this at this point because we've only got on two topics and there's a lot of people here. So um, I said I wasn't gonna have everybody answer the same question which we've been doing, but um, there's a lot of people here and so let's move on unless somebody's really burning with something that needed to be said that hasn't been said. Just to add two quick things, one is, I'm pretty uh, realistic about the power of, of the speaker and the, and the seniority system, so I don't think you're going to get instant change on that from a freshman legislator. But what we can do is begin to make that change here in our towns and in our district. We can begin voting in resolutions at the town level to say we want things like ranked choice voting. We want clean elections. I plan to run as a clean elections candidate. Some of you may remember that from years ago. We passed that by referendum. The legislature killed it. We can bring that back voluntarily. As a longtime finance Can community, you tell us who you are? I'm Michael Litterween, and I'm from Wendell, so I'm a foreigner to this district. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I'm, I'm concerned about the cost to our, my town and sister towns of building out broadband. And I have a proposal that um, our legislators would uh, pass. Michael, question? 
Here it comes. <laughs> if they should post a hundred twenty uh, pass hundred twenty million dollar bond to pay for all the construction of broadband in Western Mass. That's a good idea. Okay, so are, is there a question there? Yeah, uh, do any of the candidates support such an idea? Or the, uh, I'm going to modify the question a little bit. Do you have your own ideas about broadband? <laughs> okay, and reaching the ultimate, uh, re getting all residents um, having internet. This is a topic that I have a uniquely um, qualified day to talk about. Um, I spent the, the, the last seven years of my life uh, very much involved in broadband in general. Um, I think the biggest question here is not um, not how we're going to get there, it's who's going to pay for it. I think that's, that's what you're saying. So where are we going to get the money for this? Um, it is absolutely a huge, huge chunk of money. Um, Connecting a thousand customers in Boston requires about 50 feet of wire. Uh, putting a thousand customers in uh, Worthington is going to take you 1,500 miles. <laughs> I mean, that but not by a lot. Um, and the question of who's going to pay for it, um, I would like to see um, some of the money that's been coming in for the taxes for the new uh, legal marijuana sales go towards some of the infrastructure programs like broadband, like working on our crumbling roads and bridges. Um, and I'd like to see some of that be allocated, so a, a bond would be low, that idea, I think would be a great way for that. <laughs> so I, I think that the state should absolutely come forward and help our small towns get these last mile broadband connections. Uh, we, we have a rural electrification act to make sure that everybody's lights can turn on. There's no reason why we should not have broadband access in every single community in Western Massachusetts. Just because we choose to live in one of the most beautiful parts of the Commonwealth does not mean that we deserve broadband access any less. And I think we have to, as a state, think about this as an investment. If we are funding broadband in these smaller towns, we are fueling small businesses. Hopefully we are bringing young people back to our region. We are getting older, we are getting uh, fewer, and we need to find ways to bring people back into Western Massachusetts. So I do see this as an investment in our future that the state absolutely has to make. Thank you for the question. Um, this is something, an issue that I've been working on for a while, so serving on the Worthington Broadband Committee. And, and to address the specifics, of the, the cost, how our town's going to pay for it. So right now, we have over $70 million of state funds um, that are going through grants to, to all the 42 communities that are trying to get connected with broadband. Um, I spoke to Lieutenant Governor Polito a few weeks ago in Buckland, and she was saying, well, there's just no way you're going to get no more money. There's just no way you're going to get more money out of the budget, uh, which I will make an argument that, okay, we need to elect a Democratic governor. Uh, <laughs> uh, but also, each town that is working on the build-out of this infrastructure has their own uh, unique um, uh, financial uh, problems with, with the build out the infrastructure. And so we're working now with Comcast, with other cable companies to figure out if they can cover the other costs of the, the infrastructure. Um, but another thing that's not being talked about either is if you do have this infrastructure built and you are able to connect homes, what about the cost of the services? Um, being on the Worthington Fire Department, I've had the unique um, the perspective of seeing a lot of rural poverty in our community. And I know there are a lot of families that even though if they're able to get that connection, they might not be able to afford the $100 a month or however much that service may cost. And, right, exactly. So we have to figure out policy-wise, really talking about making broadband a public utility. Mm -hmm. uh, and making sure the assistance is there to build up the infrastructure but also maintain the services for those who may not be able to afford it. Say something <laughs> um, we really need to support the last mile um, initiative in here and then talking to different towns and in our district, the town of Leverett actually is a good example where they have a, a good infrastructure for broadband. And um, there are a lot of towns in the Franklin first that need to get access to broadband services. And what I think is, is a matter of social justice. Children who are in those districts are not able to access the education that they need. These children are already lagging behind because we don't have the services. Also see like the opportunities when we have uh, broadband services to have 
telemedicine, you know, our rural communities are medically underserved. And again, this is a big um, opportunity that we have. Um, the town of Greenfield has been working um, as an example, their neighbors, and they will be able to uh, maybe mentor. And um, you're talking about bonds, and it's a high cost. But again, we have to see each, minis each municipality, what does that mean, and how are we going to afford and vote, and do we have the local aid to be able to be there. So I. Excuse me, what it means is that none of the towns should pay to build the infrastructure. And, and that's yes, and that's actually why maybe some of the corporations will be out because they want they know that infrastructure is very costly too. So um, I would like to learn more from you, but I think um, it's still this is a, a learning curve. We're thinking are we doing optical services or are we doing a hybrid services too for broadband too? So I'm looking forward to hear what is what it um, what it means for each community to have um, affordability to have what we need, which is broadband. Um, you know, I do think we need to support the last mile initiatives and also some people near me call it the last driveway initiative because a lot of people say, well, we're going to get to my town, but then I'm told I have to pay X amount for my long driveway. What are we going to do about that? Um, and then something I've seen people struggle with that we've struggled with is, um, you know, we're in a very cooperative moment and an interesting historical moment where there's a lot of political energy and activity, but we're having a hard time you know, being heard in the Capitol. And, and we have Wired West Cooperative Initiative, where just as we brought electricity to the rural South, when all the companies and all the governments said, we cannot do this, uh, cooperative principles made that happen. And so we need to make sure that our elected officials are supporting cooperatives in their efforts to bring important services to rural areas. It's been done in the past, and, and we can do it again. So we need to work with the government to get the funding, but we also need to make sure the government is working with us, the people, to, to support our initiatives. I'm just going to quickly add that um, the other person that I was proud and humbled to be endorsed by this week was Peter Dorica, who is on the select board from Leverett. Um, Peter was one of the drivers behind Leverett's successful broadband initiative. Uh, when I was on the, when I was the president of the Franklin County Select Board Association three or four years ago, three years ago probably now, um, it dawned on, on me and the executive board that what we need to do is talk as a unified group as opposed to individual towns. We brought Peter in for best practice to talk to the select board members up and down the, 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 the valley and the rural communities about how to do it. But what Boston noticed all of a sudden was the unified voice that we were talking from. It wasn't individual towns any longer saying, I need this, I need that. This system is good for me, but that system is not good for me. What became clear was that they listened when we had a unified, cohesive, regionally organized voice to move the broadband issue. Natalie's right. Rural Electrification Act of the 1930s is the equivalent of today's broadband issue. And only working together are we going to hit the needs, sir, that you mentioned. And if we don't work together, if we work in individual community silos, we're never going to get there. <laughs> I guess I'll just say, the state made a mess of this initially. The town are trying to clean it up, and I think the state needs to follow the lead of the towns, and they need to pay for it because we don't have an economic future if we don't have uh, broadband for everyone. Because you know there are a lot of options um, in terms of how we move forward with that. I would just add that I was in Goshen when Governor Patrick came out here in 2006 to cut the ribbon on broadband, <laughs> and we've been waiting now 12 years. Uh, so it's been a long, frustrating path. But I think in that path, we've seen this, the state MBI, the Mass Broadband Institute, really shut down Wired West. That was really um, a, a cooperative effort, as people have mentioned, that uh, the state said no to. And they had to, they had to go back and reorganize. In the process, we've seen other efforts emerge. The town of Colray next to me is working with Westfield Gas and Electric. We're going to be working with them in Shelburne to complete our last mile, our last 4% in those rural areas that uh, broadband doesn't reach from Comcast. So I think there's, a, there's, there's more than one answer, and the real answer in my mind is getting municipal broadband like Greenfield is doing, and competitive broadband, so you have many 
players who are competing against our big monopoly, Comcast, which is, I'm paying twice what I would pay if I lived in Europe, for, or three times what I would pay if I lived in Europe for the same, for a lesser service. So I think we need a competitive system in our region to uh, bring down the cost and provide different solutions for different towns. Um, I'm going to take the opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> Um, something that's on my mind um, and I think probably most of us um, think about, worry about, wonder about is healthcare. Uh, how good is it? Are there enough doctors? Are there enough, uh, what do they call them, PCPs? No. <laughs> Thank you, primary care physicians. You know, because they don't make enough money. People want to be specialists. Um, how can we pay for it? Will there be Medicare? Will there be Medicaid? And so I would like to hear folks address this. I, I think I only heard one person mention single payer health care, which is close to my heart. So I would like to hear folks talk about um, health care ICU. Um, let me just see if there's any other burning questions out there. I didn't see there haven't been too many hands up. Okay, we have one back there. Okay, so we'll do health care and then we'll come to you. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you. Um, well, one of the problems that uh, universal health care has is the pharmaceutical industry is, is very powerful. Um, it's one of the first things we need to do if we're ever going to move towards a universal health care system um, is pass legislation that um, limits what the pharmaceutical companies can charge. Um, and most importantly, we need to repeal uh, the provision that prevents Medicare from negotiating with those pharmaceutical companies. Um, one of the, the, the big mysteries to me is um, Republicans getting up and saying that we can't afford this. Uh, we're already paying more than, than universal health care, all of us are. Um, and I think more than anything else, if we take the money aside from it, um, nobody should die in America from preventable disease. Nobody should go broke in America because they're trying to treat preventable disease and to treat the other loved ones. Um, and so universal health care is absolutely a big, um, big issue for me. Uh, and I'd like to see us be what we learn from mass health and apply that going forward. When my husband was building his business, um, we were in mass health. And we have an excellent health insurance. And mass health is not what it used to be. Um, Medicare people, um, homes used to be something that people would think to leave to their children and families, and now we're saying this is gonna, it's gonna be for our elderly care too. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking with people and they're saying, yes, we have the pharmaceutical companies, but how, <laughs> there's a lot of people who I know and work in the industry and I think, but you know, we, how can we leave them without a job as well? So it comes to me, we need a transition plan to serve and to know and immediately like we we kind of have people like you know I know many of you do and think about this I have a high deductible health insurance I'm constantly thinking do this month I fix my kids teeth or our teeth do it and when my child broke his two arms um actually marathon year this is two years ago and I'll tell you how you do that um we were charged with two thousand dollars of an ambulance cost and a hundred dollar payment every week when we see a radiologist and it really make a dent in our finances too. So we really this is a high priority. This is bringing families into poverty and healthcare. We need to take care of our people. So as a legislator, I will absolutely fight for Medicare, Medicaid, and a single payer's health insurance that will be affordable for all families. Yeah, I just want to say I'm very, very strongly a single pair. I think it's kind of uh, the root of everything. Um, if you're uh, a business owner or if you're a worker who is thinking about changing jobs, you know, healthcare is always a consideration. And I think that having single pair will free people, <laughs> entrepreneurs, uh, students, um, everybody to um, do what they actually want to do. Um, also, I spent the morning with the nurses of Bay State who are striking. And I was talking to them about, um, you know, what it's like to work inside um, a company where they're putting profits over people. And these are the people who are literally on the front lines. I was talking to a nurse who um, was uh, forced um, to retire because he was attacked. 
by a patient, um, and uh, actually multiple times, and finally, it, you know, put him <laughs> out of commission. And so nurses actually have a more dangerous job than police officers or other people, uh, construction workers, people you think of um, as being uh, in dangerous jobs. So I think that the entire um, healthcare um, industry is something that shouldn't be for profit, just like prisons. Three and a half weeks ago, I had hip replacement. There's nothing we should do in this country to make sure to, 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 to lessen the quality of health care we have in this country. I actually think single payer will advance that health care down the road. I absolutely do. But we need to take other steps in addition to single payer health care. My hip replacement, I have no idea what it cost. None. If somebody were to drop down on a heart attack tomorrow, they would have no idea what the cost was. But if you go to Leader Hardware, you know how much the, 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 the screws and nuts and bolts are that you're buying. We need to hold the medical industry more accountable for what they're charging us as a society. So that, it, it can't just be single payer. It has to be a combination of measures to make medical care and insurance truly work. And I'll just say real quick, you know, as an emergency medical professional, uh, being a volunteer firefighter and an emergency medical responder, I've actually been to people's houses who don't want to be transported to the hospital because they're afraid of the cost of their injury. And to me, that is absolutely unacceptable being the richest, one of the richest nations uh, in the world. I also have a lot of family members who are nurses, and I'm glad Kate had mentioned the, the nurses' strike. I absolutely believe in safe patient limits. It's unacceptable that we have uh, hospital CEOs that are uh, in part funded by taxpayers that make seven figure salaries, yet they're going to go tell the community and the nurses that they don't have the money to save staff or hospitals. Um, and when it comes to, to Medicare for All for Massachusetts specifically, it's one of the reasons I had mentioned if we could come up with a regional system. Uh, Vermont had voted to try to do that, but they realized they really didn't have enough of a population to make that really sustainable. Uh, so there's a lot we can do. And the other part of the conversation I think Jonathan was starting to touch on, so the, one of the number one employers in Massachusetts is an insurance company. Mm -hmm. So we also have to talk about if we're going to move to the system, what about workforce training so we can get those jobs back into, uh, into health care uh, and making sure that we're not hurting families while also pushing to a Medicare for All system. I just I want to recognize the community health centers, the federally qualified community health centers that are serving our most rural areas. And they're doing extraordinary work. The Hilltown Community Health Center and Franklin County Community Health Center are doing great things and we need to support them. And we do need to address how we're getting doctors and nurses to stay, to come to our area and stay in our area and incentivize that. Because if we don't have the doctors and the nurses, we're not going to have anybody to take care of us. I think you'll find a strong single-payer delegation here if we were all to go there. But while, as I mentioned with broadband, 12 years ago, being in Goshen, waiting for that to happen, that's going to be a long fight. In the meantime, we've got to ask ourselves, what can we do here in our own towns to improve our health care and lower that cost? The Hilltown Community Development Corporation does that with the Hilltown Elder Network and the HOPE Network, working with the Community Health Center providing federal funding to help low-income people access diabetic care, get home care services. We can do more of that, build that out in other towns, but we can also do that ourselves. Uh, my stepmother helped found an organization in Northampton called Northampton Neighbors. That's now spreading to Northfield, to other places where people are creating community organizations to care for each other, to visit each other, to create local services. Uh, they've done studies to say, if you do that, you will lower hospital visits. People take their medication, people feel cared for. We can do those things, and I want to work on that together with you. Uh, my name is Patricia Bell, I'm from Deerfield, and I would like to ask, since several of you mentioned Chapter 70 funding, what your ideas about fixing that broken system might look like and how you feel about the disproportionate per pupil funding between public education, uh, charter schools, and tech schools. Yeah, I'm a special counsel to the town of Cummington and I've been working on school issues uh, with them for several years now. 
And when we look at what's happening with the finances for our rural schools, the cost that has just grown exponentially is the OPEG cost, the health benefit cost. Um, we were just talking about healthcare. We need to really look at a new system for funding the healthcare costs and the benefits. And um, I was talking to someone last week who was suggesting we create a consortium, a consortium of Western Mass schools or even New England schools, so we can get together and get better healthcare programs so that we're not spending so much money because that is the, the one cost that sticks out as having grown just out of control and way beyond what we predicted in 1993 when the Chapter 70 uh, you know, foundation budget formula was created. So we need to take a good look at that formula to revamp it, but we need to especially look, look at this in conjunction with universal health care and see what we can do to get those numbers down so that we'll have enough money for schools and that these schools don't keep getting closed and, and our education shops for our kids just getting blown right out the window. So this is really a, a priority for Western Mass. Um, we've talked to, we've never mentioned that uh, our district is an aging district and there's a lot of people in the 65 and older category who are... <laughs> <laughs> Service people in our area, uh, electricians, plumbers, are also a very much aging group. The average age of an electrician in Western Mass is 62 years old, um, and that's not that's a problem that's not going to bite us today, but it's going to bite us in 10 years. And so, one of the big issues for me um, is supporting trade schools in this area. There are not enough. Franklin County has done a wonderful job of trade schools, but there's way more work to be done. I, I went to Amherst High School. There was no trade option for me at all. Uh, I left school and didn't know what I wanted to do, and I went to UMass and thought around for a while because I didn't know that I had this option that would have been lovely for somebody like me. I could have found my, you know, my, my career a lot earlier than I did. So I was twice at the school board member. I served four years, and I saw firsthand the effects of not having a proper funding education system. And I worked really hard to support my local school district to bring. Um, quality support services. So we are talking, uh, right now the state seals as a number, and we have families that are in toxic, toxic stress, so that creates homelessness and challenges. So if we don't have more, uh, don't press the Commonwealth to support more funding for the rural communities that are actually costly, the, the, lunch, um, the lunch fee doesn't work. We, we cannot make the numbers. It doesn't work that way. We are constricted. We need mental health services. The cost of health insurance are critical too. Also, a special education formula has to be adjusted. We need to talk to our federal government because we don't have enough reimbursement for that in transportation systems. I remember one time I was a child that it cost us $117,000 to care for it, and I will do every single effort because education is a success for every child in the district. And um, so, just pay it. Yeah, thank you. Down. <laughs> oh. I just want one real quick thing. I'm going to patch it down here. Um, so when it comes to the funding formula, right now it's based off of each community's uh, the income tax each community, which means that a poor town like Chester or Deerfield is not going to have the same equity as, say, a town like Cambridge. And so we need to be sure that the funding formula is addressing things like rural sparsity aid and working with the superintendent of Mohawk Regional that is really starting to bring a lot of superintendents and, and, and players together uh, on this issue. And the other thing I'll just say really quick about education, we need to focus less on high stakes standardized testing, yeah. right? We are spending a lot of money on that and it's leaving out the collaboration and the create, uh, creative environment that we need to have in our schools and the resources that teachers need uh, to fit the, the, what their students' needs are. So I just wanted to, to bring that point to the table. I think you were asking about the disparity between so I know in uh, Gateway, um, if a student goes to a charter school, $15,000 goes with him. If he goes to another public school choice uh, school, $5,000 goes with him. Um, and I think if it were up to me, uh, I would end all charter schools. I don't believe that public tax money should be going to uh, private entities that are able to um, uh, you know, push out students. They say that they accept all of them, but once they're there, they can, um, you know, uh, make them leave for whatever reason. And they do. Yeah. Okay. Um.
Full funding pre-K, full funding kindergarten. You start to treat education as a serious deal when a child is three or four, it's gonna dramatically curb the special education dollars that we spend on our children from ages six and up. It's an investment. Education is an investment. It's not a cost, it's an investment. And as a select board member in Whitley, I, full, uh, I fully know the cost of education and the balance between education and other town services. And I still say that the state needs to step up and fully fund the third, the three-year-olds and the four-year-olds that desperately needs that foundational learning. When they get the foundational learning, they will, some will still have challenges later on, but you will dramatically curb the special ed dollars that are needed because of that foundational learning that took place prior. Our mindset needs to change. It is an investment, it is not a cost, and the state needs to pick it up. So I don't think this is news to anyone, but there have been a lot of technological advances since Chapter 17 was first instituted. <laughs> and back then, they didn't have the technology to be able to go into detail that we can now, that we have access to via the internet. And so I think that we are much better able now if we, are, if we push this to the front burner on Beacon Hill, to be able to look at the differences in our school districts and be able to identify how to get parity between those school districts. But we need to push this to the front burner in Boston to be able to take a look at this and figure out how we're going to fix it. I think for, well I should start, start by saying my general philosophy is I think every parent has the right and deserves the right to make the best choice they can for their children while they're school age children. Um, having said that, I think every town also has the right to democratically support or not support the schools that it's being asked to fund. So we have four choices, public schools, school cho uh, charter schools, uh, technical schools, and uh, high need special education schools. Uh, I think that right now we don't get to vote in our town meeting uh, on charter schools. We should begin pushing to be able to do that. We can begin doing that locally. And to say whether, if a town says yes, we want to support a charter school, let them vote to do it. If they say no, send that message. Um, but we need to start asserting our democratic rights. I think, um, okay. We have to take back house. <laughs> yes, agreed. <laughs> In lieu of that, before that happens, what can the state do? Because everybody's talking about getting money from the state, but where does the state get the money? And those are the ideas you're going to have to generate when you're going through Beacon Hill. One thing that we can do, and one thing we can do as voters in 2018, is support the millionaire's tax, right? Because that will bring in a $2 billion of extra revenue to fund uh, transportation costs and education costs. Uh, so that's uh, one specific thing that we can do. But we're also going to have to talk about, uh, you know, what else can we do in tax reform wise in order to ensure that we're adequately funding everything, whether it's healthcare, education, transportation, uh, broadband services, right? So that is our job as a state representative. And the biggest thing that we have to do uh, with that is be able to collaborate with other members of the legislature and with the community uh, to ensure that we can do that to the best of our ability. That's time. <laughs> Get in there. What's your name, sir? My name is Edwin Saltz. Oh, yeah, thank you for the question. So, you know, this, this goes back to the issues. Um, we have to think of ways not of necessarily getting more money, although that's important too, but we have to think of ways to lower the cost. So again, we need to look at ways we can lower the cost of our health care, you know, and universal health care, uh, improve Medicare for all, could be a great way to approach that problem. Also, for school districts, instead of each school district individually um, going into OPED funds together, we can band together, work cooperatively with other school districts throughout the region, throughout the state, and, and that would lower our costs as well. So, you know, when we're talking about the shell game, chapter 40, chapter 70, chapter 90, yeah, you hit the nail on the head. The third largest line item in federal budget is uh, the debt. I worked for a long time with former Senator Saunders on deficit reduction in, in this country. When the deficit is reduced, the economy grows, and more money flows from the federal government to the state government, it's making it easier for them to have the money flow down to the local government. 
debt financing takes money out of schools, it takes money out of healthcare, it takes money out of everything. We need to solve our fiscal crisis, and cutting taxes is not the way to do it like it's been done at the federal government level. We need to bring back a fair and equitable ta tax base at the federal level That's to make sure the billionaire taxes. You get my point. <laughs> well said. Thank you. I just also say anything in fair taxation, whatever we do, have fair taxation. And I also want to bring that our military spend that is overeating um, every state budget too. So we have again to keep making noise about an adjustment and look into those costs. Uh, I think the, the big question here is what priority more than what actual dollar amounts. Uh, I think we need to reorganize our priorities in Massachusetts and put an education at the top of the list, put it on the opioid crisis at the top of the list, and lower some of the issues that are less important to people in Massachusetts. Um, yes, we need more money, of course, but everything needs more money. I mean, there is not you know, you know, extra money flying around everywhere. Um, I would love to see a reduction of military in the United States. That's one of my things I'd like to see. Um, but we're not going to do that in Massachusetts level. We don't have control over that. Uh, what we do have control over, though, is how we spend what we have. So I'd like to recognize the efforts of the Franklin Regional Council of Governments who has done an extraordinary job bringing people together to find those cost savings through our communities working together. Uh, I also, just as a word of caution, there are a number of ballot questions that are going to be on the ballot this fall, and I am in favor of the millionaire's tax, but there's also something there with the sales tax. If both of those pass, we got nothing. So we need to educate ourselves about the ballot questions and what each one of them means singularly and together. First of all, can we have a round of applause?